the other thing that's, that's really different about Afghanistan, and I'll close on this, is the Salafists had a really difficult time. The Salafists are real sort of puritanical kind of, uh, of, of Muslim type of uh, sect we see in Saudi Arabia. Um, is Afghanistan is the home, or at least one of the major areas, of Sufi orders. And Sufis, or Sufism, represents a, mys a mystical form of Islam. You know, Islam, in sort of its original form, is it can seen as very austere. But Sufism was a question of how does an individual come to know God individually? Falls questions of poetry. It can involve ritual dance. It can involve reciting parts of the Quran in a way that puts people into trance. Afghanistan is one of the centers of Sufism. And the one thing the Salafists really don't like are Sufi orders. They consider them to be heretical. But in Afghanistan, this is a baseline of the culture. If you go, you will see the grave of a Sufi saint. You will see flags on that uh, grave. You will see flags on graves of martyrs. And women will come there to pray for to have children. If you're a Salafist, you say, you can't do that. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, they ripped up every single shrine over a grave, arguing to elevate anybody above God is wrong. There used to be wonderful shrines in Saudi Arabia, totally destroyed, because the Salafists believe that's worshiping an individual. In Afghanistan, what we have are these Sufi orders. And what this creates, these are very large networks, and they cross tribal divisions. And what we find is a Sufi peer, person in charge, and his disciple, a Morid. And this peer Morid relationship is incredibly strong. And particularly in a lot of the Pashtun areas, a Sufi saint, a peer, has disciples across different tribal lines. So peers and others are often brought in to settle problems because they're outside the tribal system and because they have relations across tribal lines. So what we see here is an importance of religion binding people together. But also, not only the Taliban were opposed to this, Afghan governments have been opposed to this, particularly Amir Abdurrahman, because he saw this as a counter to state power and influence. These people were independent. They didn't need to tax. People gave them gifts. They had a huge network, a huge influence, but you really couldn't identify it. You never knew what was there, because you know, there wasn't like a, a long list. It was all personal relationships. And some of these groups went back many centuries. Some were based on charismatic leaders. And even among the Taliban in Kandahar, I remember talking when I was interviewing somebody, and Taliban were supposed to be against this. He said, well, you've got you to be careful on that. During the Taliban period, he went to a police station in Kandahar, and nobody was there. But he heard some mumbling in the back. He went, there was a Sufi circle of Taliban doing a zikr, doing a ritual chant. Now, if their bosses had heard about that, you know, this was wrong. But they weren't going to invite any Salafist Arabs. But Kandahar, Kabul, and particularly Mazar, Harat, have been centers of Sufism for centuries upon centuries. And this goes very, very deep in Afghan culture. So when I talk about identity of religion, this identity also includes a very spiritual side. So particularly this push after 30 years of war to talk about jihad, 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 the Sufis push back. Is jihad is not the most important aspect of the faith. Indeed, they're the ones that make the argument that the greater jihad is the one to fight sin in yourself, not to fight other people. Indeed, they like to point to a surah, to, to a uh, hadith, a saying of the prophet, in which it's actually argued, you can't kill infidels. You can't kill other people, because the prophet was supposed to have said, how do you know whether he's a Muslim or not when you're killing him? Do you know what's inside? He could have converted. He could have been at the last. You do not know what's inside another person's heart. Who are you to kill him on the basis of faith when you don't know that faith? As in any religion, you can pull 
sayings to justify one situation or another. But right now in Afghanistan, um, religion, which has played a fairly detrimental role in terms of its Taliban side, people forget that Afghans also have used it as a way to bring people together. So as this transition is coming, particularly 30 years of, of war in Afghanistan, one of the things in terms of holding it together is going back to this older tradition of saying that there's no reason for people to fight one another. And very strong religious justification from that, and particularly coming out of these sort of cross-cutting ties. Do we know very much about that? No. Because actually, the outside world knows very little about Afghanistan. So things there always take us by surprise. But at any rate, I hope that things